أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور أرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستغ الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ونريد أن نمنا على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض ونجعلهم أئمة ونجعلهم الوارثين صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I begin in his blessed name Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with an innate desire for justice A moral system demands good behavior that promotes positive lifestyles, that brings about a progressive community, not only materially but spiritually, because at the end of the day it's all about the spirituality of things, for material things are only a means to a higher achievement. When we try to achieve wealth, it's because we want to be happy. Happiness is not a material entity, it's a state of mind. You notice Allah has given us two particular components of life, in life, to deal with. One is material, the other one is spiritual. These two components are inseparable, and if we try to negate one over the other, then we will fail in life. Material acquisitions are as important, but the spiritual component is superior to the material, but the material component is essential to complete the human being. So we have to eat, we have to sleep, we have to clothe ourselves, we have to work, we have to make money. We need a lifestyle of comfort, we need food to be able to think. These are all material acquisitions. But at the end of the day, after we acquire these material necessities, which by the way, a human being can be very meager in their needs. You know, there's a difference between need and want. If we just focus on the needs, our lives will be much happier than the wants. Because wants have an infinite quality. Whereas needs are finite and pragmatic and practical. A true believer understands these two. They indulge in the wants, but always with Allah in mind. And therefore they never go out of line. Their desire is to possess the infinite, but that infinite is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be close to Allah, qurbatan ila Allah. But that's the material component, and then the spiritual. Even when we acquire the material, if we don't feel comfortable with what we have acquired through halal means, for example, if I was a crook and a criminal and I stole and I made millions of dollars, something in my conscience, consciousness is going to bother me. I will never be satisfied and happy because the way I achieved it was through the wrong means. And I can never achieve virtue through vice. As you know, Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has said that you can't achieve virtue through vice. You cannot lie. You cannot be Robin Hood. You cannot steal from the rich and feed the poor. It's not allowed. It's haram. You cannot take food from the market to go feed the poor. There's a story of a man who was doing that. You know, and he says, Allah says in the Quran, when you do a good deed, Allah multiplies it ten times. When you do a bad deed, it's one to one. So then, look, I took a bad deed, but I gave a good deed, so I'm still eight ahead. Imam Jafar Sadiq salam, notices this man, Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. He says to him, you have not achieved any good, because when you took it, it wasn't yours. So whatever you gave was not good, so you earn nothing but wrong. Because you, for you to say, I did a wrong thing, but then I did a right thing. You cannot do a right thing through the wrong thing. You cannot steal to help. You have to earn it the halal way. Otherwise, it's not acceptable. Otherwise, the Messenger of Allah would have said to the Meccans, okay, I'll become the head of the Kaaba, I'll take the key, and then eventually I'll convert everybody you know, to the right path. 
The Prophet said, if you put the moon in one hand and the sun in the other, I will not stop preaching La ilaha illallah. And they banished him. They wanted to kill him, but he refused. He said, I will never achieve virtue through vice. Only through haqq. Qul al haqq wa zahq al batil. Inna al batil kana zahuqa. Truth is prevalent, falsehood is ever vanishing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this very clearly in the Quran in Surah Isra. So we know this. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to promote good in the halal way, but He wants us to be happy. So whatever achievements we have has to have meaning and value. That meaning and value is built on a system of balance, justice of Allah. So Allah commands us in Surah Rahman, Allah says, وَأَقِيمُوا الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْطِ وَلَا تُخْسِرُوا الْمِيزَانِ Maintain, you know, measure the scale with justice. بِالْقِسْطِ With balance. And don't tip the balance. Be just. This world is all about balancing. Islam is a balancing religion. It's a religion that does justice on all sides. Anytime you tip one over the other, you've gone wrong. For example, to give you a simple example of tipping, if I say to you salah, we say salah, Quran says in the salah ta tanha anil fahsha iwal munkar wala dhikrullahi akbar. Indeed, prayer keeps you away from wrongdoing and evil. And it is a great deed, isn't it? So there was a man in the masjid who was praying. And Rasulullah would come in, he would see this man praying. He leaves, he sees him praying. He comes back, he's praying. For the whole day, this man is praying. He keeps seeing them for a few days. He said, MashaAllah, you pray a lot. He said, I love to pray. Well, akbar. So the Prophet asked him, who takes care of your family? He says, my brother. The messenger said, go home. Your brother is better in the eyes of Allah than you. Notice, the man said, but I'm praying to Allah. Allah did not want us to be in the masjid 24 hours a day to pray and to abandon our children and to abandon our needs. Going for, to earn a living feeding our children, feeding the neighbors, giving charity, building empires for Allah, building structures for Allah, is ibadah. Ibadah is not just praying. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّ وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنْ آمَنَ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ There are many. وَالْمَلَائِكَ وَالْكِتَابِ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامِ Allah says, righteousness is not that you face east or west. لَيْسَ الْبِرَّ أَن تُوَلُّ وُجُوهَكُمْ قِبَلَ الْمَشْرِكِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ Righteousness has a balance where you earn but you give charity. When you give charity, you do it for Allah. When you pray, you pray the proper way. When you earn, you earn the halal way. When you go to sleep, you know how to sleep properly. It's a balancing act, brothers and sisters. Those who tip the balance, who become excessively spiritual, that they even disengage from the human race and they don't even want to have social uh, transactions because they, are so, they want to make, maintain such purity of life. This is not Islam. This is monkery, rahbaniya, and the Quran forbids monkery. Monkery means you go out and carve yourself in a little cave and all day you just worship God. Allah says, I don't want this. Allah never commissioned us to go up to a mountain and to disconnect from the society. Short disconnections are recommended. Where you go and you meditate, you reflect on the purpose of life, but you come back to engage with the rest of the world. You'll never find any of our prophets or messengers ever disengage from society. They were in the thick of everything, in all the problems and transactions. They were right smack in the middle. Because that is what Islam is all about. It's a balancing act between two entities, material and spiritual. We must understand these two. But ultimately, when I talk about spiritual, it has a means. As we say, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُكُمْ بِالنِّيَّةِ The messenger said, indeed your deeds are subject to your intentions. And the intention has this connotation of spirituality that when I'm going to make a move, I do qurbatan ilallah. Now even if you die, you have died the death of shahada. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with this innate nature for justice. I'm using justice in a very loose way, but bear, bear in mind, even the scale is justice. The, the judicial system in court to give everything its proper due is justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the universe in truth. Allah says, He created the sky and the earth with truth. Truth tawasu bil haq. Haq, in a deep meaning, its transaction of haq 
is giving everything his proper due. Imam Ali alayhi salam says, if you allow me to sit on the seat, of, the seat of justice, if you unfold the seat of justice for me, and you allow me to pass judgment, I will not deny an insect the husk of its grain. That's how detailed Imam says, that justice, adalat, to give the way it should be. As you know, Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he was the khalifa of the time, you find there was a man who took his armor. In one of the battles, he took it. It belonged to a blessed Imam. He is the Khalifa of the time. He can imprison the man, he can behead him, he can throw him, he can do whatever he wants because authority. But Allah is showing us look at leadership. This is leadership. Leadership of the highest kind that when Imam Ali lodges a complaint, he goes to the Qadi Shari, who is the chief judge and lodges the complaint. The chief judge subpoenas the other man and says, come to court, for you have been accused of stealing. When Imam Ali enters the court, the Qadi Shari knows this is the Khalifa of the time. He addresses him as Amir al muminin Imam says, you have done breach of justice by addressing me as Amir al muminin in this scenario. For the accused is not given that title. You have already passed judgment in my favor. And that's unacceptable. Subhanallah. This is waqimul wazna bil qist wa la tukhsirul mizan. You and I would never be able to practice this. Believe me. When I said never, I'm saying very, very difficult. We can, but it is such a difficult task. When you and I become big shots and bosses and we're rich and powerful and everybody's under our tutelage, you think it's a joke to belittle yourself or to humble yourself in the, in the system of justice when you know it's entirely in your hands? It's very difficult. Trust me, when we become sh big shots and leaders and public speakers, our heads flare up this big and we think we're the greatest thing that ever walked this earth. When, when we are nothing. This is the blessed Imam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates. You know, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَالرَّسُولُ الَّذِينَ آمُنَ الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةَ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةَ هُمْ رَاكِعُونَ when Imam Ali gives his zakat in the state of Ruku, Allah says, Inna ma waliyukum Allah. These are my authorities. Allah, the messenger and the one who gives zakat in the state of Ruku. So, this is a man now who goes to court and he's telling the judge, you have done a breach of justice. Do not give me an appellation. Call me my name, just like the way you call him. If you give me a title, you have to give him a title. Then, the judge asks Imam Ali Islam, I need to see witnesses proving your point that this shield belongs to you. Imam says, my son, Hassan, salam, is the witness, but he's out of town. So I don't have a witness. The judge says, I'm sorry. Then the armor remains in the man's hand. <laughs> Subhanallah. Imam Ali agrees. He walks out. That man, some say he was Jewish, some say he was Christian. They say he was Bani Israeli. He comes after Imam Ali. Salam. He says, I want to be a Muslim. I want to follow you. Imam says, why? He says, in my life I have never seen a man authorized by God to be in such command that you could have passed any judgment and bribed that judge or you could have just taken this shield which is really yours. I agree, I took it. But you are such a man of justice. I have never seen such a person that I am left with no choice but to follow you. And Imam Ali alayhi salam looks at him and says, follow principles, not personalities. And the man becomes a believer just by a simple transaction of وَقِيمُ الْوَزْنَ بِالْقِسْتِ وَلَا تُخْسِرُ الْمِيزَانِ Salu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Can you and I do justice with each other? Can we give the justice that we deserve? That's the question. Tonight's presentation, as we speak about, is about Imam Mahdi alayhi salatu wa salam. The... 12th Imam. <laughs> now I know within our community we have people of various schools of thought, we have people outside of Islam who participate in these gatherings. So it's only fair to talk about the Mahdi. Who is the Mahdi? Who is this Imam who is in occultation? What's his position? Why is he necessary? What makes them so unique to be a follower of the Ja'afari school of thought that believes in the 12 Imams and the 12th one being alive for 1200 years? How is that possible? Imams should be born, you know, and they should come within the time. And since when is this notion of the hidden in Islam? People ask these questions and we need to discuss it briefly. It's a very broad subject, but 
I will just arrange it in a way, so hopefully it will be palatable for us all to understand, for the concept is not difficult. It is understandable if we understand the spirit of the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So let me address it please. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has commanded the believers to obey the ones vested with authority from among you. As Allah says in Surah An-Nisa, as I mentioned again, Ya ayyuhu alladhina amanu ati'u Allah wa ati'u rasul wa ulil amri minkum. Here, the third group is a command of Allah that is unconditional, as I mentioned in my previous lecture, and there is always a representative of Allah on earth. So the command of the ayah is, wa ulil amri minkum. Minkum means who vested among you right now. It's, it's present, not past, not future. It's now. It's always now. Wa ulil amri minkum, minkum, minkum. And the messenger explains that after me there will be 12 imams over you, 12. One after the other, he mentions the name. Even uh, Ibn Hajar al-Makki, who has written a book, Sawaq al uh, you know, some say that uh, he had written that book to counter these different schools of thought. Among those scholars within Islam, there is prevalence of understanding that these 12 imams have been mentioned by name. Even the Umayyad Caliphate and the Abbasid Caliphate knew there's a coming of this Imam of the time. Now if you think this is a concoction, let's go back in history and see even Fir'aun, who was an enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even he knew of the coming of Musa. Now this is an enemy of Allah, how does he know? He knew so well of the coming of the Savior of Islam in his time, that he will be a firstborn among the Bani Israel. And you find that the Pharaoh was killing the firstborn among the Bani Israel to challenge God by saying that I will prevent this from happening. And you don't mess around with Allah, as you know. You mess with Allah, He's going to rub it into you because wa makaru wa makar Allah, Allah khairul makirin. Allah says, please don't mess with me. I created you when you were nothing. And Allah brings Musa alayhi salam into the house of Pharaoh, and Allah says, since you were killing, you will raise him. Subhanallah. You want to see insult added to injury? Here's Allah now. He says, you want to mess with me? You will raise him. How's that? Even Firaun was like, didn't I raise you? Musa said, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, you did raise me. <laughs> he says, wait a minute. I was killing them all. Allah says, you can't play with me. I'll bring him to you. And he is going to destroy you with one piece of stick. Okay? So don't mess with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The point is that the knowing of the coming of the Savior, the Redeemer of the time, was very common and popular. Even the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coming in Medina. If you study the history of Jews, the Bani Israel, they were not known to be in Medina. Medina was not their region. They migrated to Medina historically because they heard the Messiah will come in Medina. In fact, they used to taunt the Aus and the Khazraj tribe telling them soon our Messiah is coming. Subhanallah. And Allah brought the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to Medina. As we know, Medina al-Munawwara. This is the Medina of light. Munawwar was the Holy Prophet's name. That when he came, the Jews came and asked him, tell us the following questions that we have been told of the previous scriptures that you should be able to answer. And the messenger answered all of them. They even wanted to see the seal on his shoulder. They say they lifted his shirt, they saw the seal. But even then they refused. They said, you're not of the Bani Israel. We can't accept you. Yet he was a cousin of Isa a.s. Don't forget, the Holy Prophet is the distant cousin of Isa a.s. From the same family. Yet they refused. The point in, in, to make here is that they knew the coming of the Messiah at different times. This is not something secretive. So we have numerous hadith of the Holy Prophet explaining to us when the Mahdi will come. The concept of Mahdi is pegged with the system of justice. So the ayah that I recited in Surah Qasas, verse number 5, Allah says, وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ it is our desire, Allah says. Here, arada of Allah SWT is always performed. It's done. Like when Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ Allah doesn't wish. When He says it, it is the desire of Allah, it's not something that will happen tomorrow. This ayah, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ الله, To purify the Ahlul Bayt with a thorough purification, rids to remove all impurities from you, all family of the Prophet. This Ahlul Bayt, the specific ones I was talking about yesterday, purity. 
with such purity that there is not no dirt in them. Their actions, as we call them, are infallible. And we'll talk about infallibility, uh, infallibility briefly. I mentioned this before, but please understand, infallibility of prophets and imams is no comparison to Allah. Allah is beyond infallibility. Infallibility is a comparative met method. Infallibility with Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim is a, is a, is a non-sequitur, as we say. It's, it doesn't, doesn't work. We can't say Allah is perfect. He's a perfect creator, but He can't be compared. He's beyond perfection. Because when we say He's perfect, then there's room for imperfection. No, Allah is beyond that conversation. But among His creations who are prophets and imams, they are given perfection to make sure that the message is delivered perfectly and the message is protected perfectly. So please understand that. So when we talk about Ahlul Bayt, Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّدْزِ To remove from you any uncleanliness. Now this ayah, if you read the grammar of it, the implication is not that they had and God removed. The ayah means they never had and Allah has always kept it. Please understand, the grammatical language of Arabic, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ The arada is indefinite. It's not going to happen in the future. It was happening, is happening, and will happen. That's why Allah says, إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّدْزَ أَهْلِ الْبَيْتِ وَيْتَحِرَكُمْ تَتْحِيرًا صلى الله عليه وسلم محمد وآل محمد The same irada. Irada is desire. The will of Allah. إِذَا قَضَى أَمْرًا فَإِنَّمَا When God decrees a matter. All these decrees are under this principles of irada, the desire of Allah. And when Allah desires something, it's not time-based. Remember, Allah is not bound in time. Allah created time. When He tells me, it doesn't mean He's going to do it. It means it's already in motion. Otherwise, He won't tell me. Because if He's going to, we would never understand what does that mean. What Allah implies is that this motion of Irada, وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Implication is مُسْتَضْعَفِينَ مُسْتَضْعَفِينَ are people who are People who are not allowed to speak the truth. People who are not allowed to practice the truth. People who are not allowed to be just. These are مُسْتَضْعَفِينَ Not the ones who are criminals, committing crimes. The ones who want to do good but they're not allowed to do good. The ones who want to speak the truth, but they're not allowed to speak the truth. The ones who want to progress in life, but they're being prevented from progressing. By the way, that's the majority of the human race. Majority of the human race are mustadafin. Majority. We are oppressed people. If you look at even the economy of the world, just the 1% as we call it, rules the world. The vast majority of the human race is below those economic levels. Why? There's plenty of money to go around. It's because they're keeping it. Food. There's enough food for the human race to eat their fill four times a day, statistically. We have seven billion people in the world today. You know that? That's a lot of people. In another ten years, we may go to nine billion. It's doubling, you know. It's becoming what we call uh, exponential. People are worried. Population overload, you know. The world is resources are less. You know that if you took 7 billion people, all of them, you can line them up from one part of, and you can fill them in the state of California only. Do you know that? 7 billion. This is coming from the World Human uh, Organization of the United Nations. He made this comment. He says, you take all 7 billion people, they will fit in just one state of California. The world is vast. So much land has not been used yet. Resources are plenty. We are destroying it. We are absorbing it. We are preventing the food from reaching. When you look at Somalia, you look at Ethiopia, you look at Africa, it's our misdeeds because of our economic masters who are above, who are trying to make their billions, that they are preventing these games. That our children are dying of starvation. People ask, why is God allowing all these children to die? I said, God is not doing it. It is humans who are doing it. Allah says, Inna Allah la yadlim an nasa shay'an. Allah doesn't do dhulam to insan even a little. Mankind does dhulam to, uh, to insan. So our obligation, brothers and sisters, is to understand that while we're on this earth, you and I have been empowered to be proactive. A quick lesson in life, just a quick footnote. 
the world is always driven by a vocal minority. No society has ever been driven by the silent majority. Never. You never hear a vocal majority. It never happens. If it does, it comes on the radar and disappears. It's only because somebody poked them and they got angry. Otherwise, they're always sleeping. Majority is always sleeping. It's that vocal minority that moves the beast in their directions. The world is where it is today because there is a group of vocal minorities who move societies and we all become victims of it. Media is a good example of vocal minority. There's a few people who, who master it. They present it to you their way. They present it in a very legitimate way. You really think what they've done is their homework and what they are telling you is the truth and we accept it as truth and we start to believe them and we start living the way they want us to live. It's always vocal minority. The messenger of Allah was also a vocal minority in Mecca. The group of people who were with him, who migrated, they were a vocal minority. And they moved the world. Look at this. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, don't think you need to be a majority to move society. You need just to be vocal and proactive. And your community will respond. The world is in need of guidance. Let us not sit around and say there's injustice taking place and all these children are dying. What can we do? We're just, we're, we are debilitated. We are unable to. Don't say that because the one who's doing it is also a single guy and a single group of people. Don't be fooled. Don't think the world is joining them in doing the criminal activities. No, no. There's a small group of bandits who are doing this. You and I need to counter that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold us liable on judgment day. What did you do? Didn't you rise to stop that? If there's an eye in the Quran, Allah says that when the angels are about to fling them into hell, they said, what happened to you in your state? They said, we were mustad'afeen, we were oppressed. The angels will ask, wasn't the world wide enough for you to migrate? Couldn't you move out? Couldn't you do something? Allah says, we may grant them paradise, we may grant them hell. But the mustad'afeen, if they are truly mustad'afeen, Allah will help them. You and I are mustad'afeen in various ways. We are victims of history, we are victims of economics, we are victims of governmental pressures, and the global governmentals. All around the world, there's always somebody figuring out the do's and don'ts of things that we need to do. They may even conflict with our own spirituality in Islam. But that's the life that we work with, right? It's okay. But let us be proactive. So Allah in the Quran says, It is my desire to make you, O oppressed ones, leaders. To make you leaders. And to make you the inheritors. Here, this ayah is in particularly aiming towards the coming of Imam Mahdi alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, within all the five major schools of thought, there is a constant, there is, a, there is consensus among all the Muslim ummah, regardless of what school of thought you belong to, of the coming of the Mahdi. The messianic concept is not only in Islam, it is even in Buddhism. Even the Buddhists believe that every thousand years there is a Messiah who comes and reforms the society. The need for reformation, the need for balancing the world, the need to bring justice is an innate quality of humanity. Christians believe Isa will come back as the second coming of Christ who will bring justice again. Right? The Jews believe in the coming of the Messiah. They're still waiting for the Messiah. And they believe in the Redeemer also. Hindus even believe in this concept. This is not a unique concept to Islam. But within Islam, there is consensus that this Mahdi who will come, will come from the loins, from the generation of Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, and Fatima al-Zahra, Salamullahi alayha. There's a general consensus in this. The difference between the major schools of thought is that one group says he's not born yet, he will be born from that generation, he will come and he will establish justice. Those who follow the Ja'afari school of thought said no, he was already born 1200 years ago in 255 AH, which is 255 years after Hijra, in the time of the Abbasid Caliphate, okay, Mu'tasim and Mutawakkil, after Mutawakkil, you find that he will be born, and he has already been born, and he, he was on this, uh, in the visible planes of the people. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
hid him in ghaybah. Now people ask this question, what, how, explain how does this work? The way we understand it is when he was born, he came in a very difficult time. He, even his birth was secretive. And as you know, Hakima, who was the aunt of our 11th Imam, was the one who was the midwife who witnessed. This is proof, by the way, that women can be witnesses alone without men. But double witness of women is only in business transactions. Otherwise, women share the same quality when it comes to their witnessing across the globe. What we find is that there are conditions where men are given certain authority, women are given certain authority. In certain cases, they have the upper hand. In other cases, the men have the upper hand. Here, Hakima was the only one who witnessed the birth of Imam Sahib Zaman salam. And they say, historians say that when his, his father, the blessed Imam Hassan al-Askari, who is buried in, uh, in Samara in Iraq, that when he held him as the baby, this little child was speaking and said, He was reciting this ayah. It is our desire to make you o oppressed, the inheritors and the imams, and the imams and the inheritors of this world. So the imam's mission had started already, but Allah brought him to be that witness of the twelve. And Quran says, Nurun ala nur. The Quran also says, Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. We know there's always a khalifa on earth at all times. And therefore the imam being with us for twelve centuries is not outlandish, it's not absurd at all. In fact, we find Nuh alayhi salam preached for 950 years in the Quran without any problem. Iblis, before his fall from his position, worshipped Allah for 6,000 plus years, still alive, will be alive till the day of judgment. How does something remain alive till that day? Allah says, I can keep anything alive for as long as I will. So this idea that human race has to be only a certain age is not a valid argument. Now the question is, why do we need a living imam when we can't see him? And Allah mentions, by the way, in Surah Isra, he says that, يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَامِهِمْ On that day, every human being will be raised by their imam. There is an imam who is always present for its people at all times. Quran says it. يَوْمَ نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ All of mankind will be raised with their imam. And the messenger has said, أَفْضَلُ الْعِبَادَ إِنْتَظَارِ الْمَهْدِ He says one of the best ibadah is to have the intadar, the desire to meet the Mahdi of the time, the Imam of the time or the Prophet of the time. When we go back in history, we find even Salman, who was a companion of the Holy Prophet, as you know, a great companion. Salman was a Persian. His original name was Ruzbeh. And he migrated, he ran away from his father who wanted to kill him. And his father was an aristocrat, wealthy man, but a Zoroastrian who worshipped the, the fire as God. And Salman rejected the worship of fire and said, fire is unacceptable in my ethos. I will never submit to this because this is sustained, maintained. It has an origin, it has a departure, it cannot be God. His father wanted to kill him and he escapes and he ends up in a monastery. He remains in a monastery as a Christian for 10 years. But a Christian who was a muwahid, meaning he was a true Ahl al-Kitabi, who believed in La ilaha illallah, Isa Rasulillah. Not La ilaha illallah, Isa uh, ibn Allah. No, Rasulillah. Then after 10 years, Salman realized that there's something lacking here. There's something more to this. I need to go get it. He leaves the monastery. Unfortunately, when he comes out, he's, because he's so good looking, so powerful, and so alone, they grab him and they sell him on the slave market. He ends up being a slave. He gets taken all the way into Medina and he remains one Jewish owner to another as a slave. So while the messenger of Allah is leaving Mecca, going to Medina, Salman is already in Medina suffering as a slave for 13 years. And then when the messenger arrives in Medina, Salman's inner conscience is telling him that I have something is my destiny, I'm going towards it. In Tadar. When you have this desire, brothers and sisters, you don't have to see it. The real essence of Salman is not anything after. It's the preceding one going towards his Imam of the time, which is the Holy Prophet Subhanallah. Think about this. So when Salman was on a tree, historians say his owner was talking to another man of Bani Israel and said there is this man calling himself the Prophet of God 
and his name is Muhammad. Salman became so excited, he was on the tree, he jumped from the tree down, and he was excited to hear the conversation. And historians say that his owner slapped him and told him, get back up there and don't you ever come and eavesdrop in our conversation. But Salman was ready to meet it. He was given a small errand to perform in Medina, and he took a short detour in his errand, and he said, I reached this tent and I saw light coming out of the tent. He said, I knew I have reached my destiny. SubhanAllah. From fighting from his father, from the escape of worshipping fire, to the time of joining a monastery, to the point, to the reaching of his intadhar, of wanting to see the representative of Allah. He says, before entering, I knew I had reached my destiny. He said, when I opened the curtains and I entered, I knew I had reached my destiny. He said, I put my eyes on this blessed prophet, they said the messenger of Allah was so handsome, so good looking that even his sweat used to fall like pearls from his face. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And Salman, as you know, when he enters, the Prophet says, Welcome. We, you know, and he welcomes him and changes his name to Salman. That's why he's known as Salman Islam. That's his name. Okay, and then Salman is showing his intadhar. The same intadhar in essence is what you and I need to have. That this imam should always be present in the living. There are many reasons. If you say the messenger was there 14 centuries ago, Allah has taken him, he's here in spirit. Because Allah says, وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ لَوْ يُطِعْكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِدْتُمْ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّ بِإِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ Allah says in Surah Hujurat, that وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Know that the Prophet is among you. What, were he to follow your suggestions, لَوْ يُطِعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنَ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِدْتُمْ If he was to follow your deeds, your suggestions, there would be many mishaps. Meaning the Prophet took suggestions from people, but he made the decision. And he never flawed on his decision. Allah says, if he listened to you, he would have gone astray many a times. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, look what a rahmah he is. That just looking at him is ibadah. Imagining him and being in his presence is ibadah. That's why the shahadatain is so important. But Allah has kept a physical representative of the Prophet at all times to check us in this spiritual journey. This is why the belief in the hidden Imam is within our constraints. We believe, from the belief in the Imam, that even when Iblis fell, he fell from his position because of Adam. He knew that before Adam, he had a high position. So he wants to take Adam with him to hell. So what does he do? He asks Allah for a, for a desire to be fulfilled for having worshipped Allah. Allah says, ask. He said, give me respite till the day of judgment to take this being with me to hell. He says, فَبِعِزَّتِكَ لَأَغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ So, by your authority, I will do this. Now, why did he ask to be alive till judgment day? Why did he just say, let me take Adam, his generation, his children, grandchildren, and then I die? Because he knew the representative of Allah is always on earth till the day of judgment. So he wants to be present on the opposite. Now the adalat, the justice system of Allah is as follows. People ask me that how can this imam who is in hiding benefit us? You're saying he's around me. He doesn't benefit me. Where is he? I can't see him. So my question I ask basically first and foremost is if seeing somebody is the sign of benefit, then you have to agree, you have to agree that seeing somebody is also the sign of destruction. Now Allah has already told us that shaitan destroys us. He is our enemy. So how can a being who none of us have seen, which is Iblis, we all agree he causes harm to us. How does he cause harm when you can't see him? Hmm? Notice, we say, oh, how can the imam be their beneficial? I said, okay, how can shaitan bother you? You haven't seen him. It's probably a figment of your imagination. Hmm? So, no, 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 Quran says, Allah made you have any Adam, Allah ta'abudu shaitan, la ta'abudu shaitan, innahu lakum adumum mubi, he's your great enemy. I said, How can he be my great enemy? I haven't seen him. How does he look? <laughs> I tell you, we have, we have so much yaqeen about Iblis. If I turn the light off right now in this room and say, The devil is in here, we'll all run outside. <laughs> I turn the light on, I say, Allah is here. We say, Where? Allah is here? We can't see him. Yeah, devil you can't see either. How can you run? 
well, something about the unknown, you know, with the darkness. <laughs> we have no problems with Iblis. Iblis is, is laughing. Look, with me, they got no problems. <laughs> they haven't even seen how I look. I'm pretty ugly, but that's a different thing, you know. The point is, he's a beautiful creation, but his deeds are ugly. So he is, his presence now is ugly. But none of us have seen Iblis. Only prophets can see Iblis. Only select people can see Iblis. Adam could see him. Most people, no human being generally can see him. Notice that there is an exclusionary principle that some can see, not everybody can see. Just like the Imam who's in hiding. He is seen by some, but not by all. But people ask, where is the benefit? I said, where is the benefit of angels to me? Allah says, angels pray for me. And so the Zumar, angels do dhikr for us. Angels pray for us. Quran says that. Well, where is the angel benefiting from me? And I can't even see how an angel looks. Have you seen an angel? How does he look? Allah says, that's the unseen. You have to have faith in me. I am telling you they're here. I am telling you their function. That's the matter of belief that you have to deduce by the arguments of my creation in this universe. You have to come to this conclusion. So how is this one harming you? How is that now one harming you? Allah's adala justice is that for him to place me on this earth with the antithesis of Allah whispering from all directions and I can't see him. When Allah doesn't counter that with a living representative, it begs, it begs the challenge of justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah is just then get rid of Iblis therefore there is no need for a living Imam otherwise as long as there is a living enemy of Allah then there is always a living representative of Allah sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad there are many issues justice our inner core but let's go to the core of the justice system we all have a desire even atheists when they tell me you know that I don't believe in God I said do you have a desire for justice they said yes I said, why? Oh, well, it's good. I said, okay, let's say your loved one got killed. You know he went to nothing, according to you. So why worry? You should be happy. He's nothing. No more pain. It's over. No, no, no. I need justice. I said, come on. Practice it, for God's sakes. You say he went to nothing. No pain, non-existence. Isn't that great? I mean, you're complaining while you're here. And you're happy you're going to go to nothing. So he's already nothing. What do you need justice for? Justice was he went to nothing. He came from nothing. He went to nothing. Isn't that all justice about? He said, no, 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 no. We got to catch the killer. I said, why? Why bother? He said, something innate. I said, precisely. Something about us that demands a moral justice system. I said, the difference between you and me is we both want justice, but your justice is short-lived. Mine is eternal. And I will ask you, who's wiser? One who thinks short term or the one who thinks long term? They'll tell you long term. I said the theist is wiser. Because <laughs> the one who believes in God thinks justice forever. You think short term. So it's wiser for you to think long term. So therefore you should consider the day of judgment as the system of justice logically because it's the wiser position than the one to say that I'm going to die and become nothing. Yet while you're alive you are insisting on justice. This innate desire for justice is where Imam Mahdi والسلام, comes in full fruition. That our desire to want justice in the world, where those who are robbing the, the, uh, the, just, the rights of uh, the innocent people of the world, they are given their dues. This is why our iman, by the way, many times people lose faith in Allah when they see blatant injustice in the world and nothing's happening. In fact, many people become unjust. They throw the towel in and they become unjust because they see there's so much injustice that if I fight for, in, for justice, I will also be the one who will be punished. Many a times people join the unjust systems. And many a times people lose faith in God. But Allah says, Inna Allah ma'as-sabirin. Even Luqman says to his son, Wasbir ala ma'asabak. Inna thalika min azmi al-umur. Be patient. This world is a difficult world. But the justice of Allah is a guarantee. Wa nuridu anna munna ala alladheena stuf'ifu fi al-ard. We are going to bring it. But you need to participate. So let me end on these issues very briefly to tie them in. Inshallah, if they're in the Q&A, we can discuss it further. First, why did Allah make, put him in hiding? If you look, the messenger of Allah came for 23 years in public. 40 years he was silent as a prophet. 23 years he practiced in public as a prophet. So 63 years, if you do the math, he roughly had three to four years of peaceful time, if you want to give it that. It's not enough. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wisdom was to give extension to the Prophet, 
through reflectors of his own kind that would come for 250 plus years to explain the lessons of Islam to us. Even if you look at all the five major schools of thought, you will see that even Imam Malik, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Shafi, Imam Abu, uh, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, all of them were either students or, or indirect students of Imam Jafar Sadiq. The sixth Imam was their teacher. He taught them all directly or indirectly. This is, this is a common fact, historical fact. Imam Malik bin Anas and Imam uh, Abu Hanifa, they were both students of Imam Jafar Sadiq directly. Why were they students then? Because they were, Imam Jafar Sadiq was the reflector of the Prophet. In his, in his domain, there were thousands. He had two, two, two three thousand students at a time teaching them. What is he teaching? He's teaching the, what the Prophet said. Now, Imam Jafar Sadiq came during the time when the Umayyad Empire was collapsing and the Abbasid Empire was rising. Notice, the reason he had that chance was because this monstrous empires were busy fighting with each other, they forgot to focus on the Imam of the time. And hence the Imam was given freedom to express this great message of Islam, which became the, the, the school of all thoughts. Even Imam uh, Malik, he said, Imam Abu Hanifa says, had it not been for Jafar Sadiq, we would not have achieved any knowledge. He was our teacher. So the point is that Allah extended prophethood over a span of 255 years, then, when the message was sufficiently given to the people, Allah takes the Imam into hiding to now create a new dimension in society, which is the dimension of ijtihad in its fullest form. You see, when the Imam is present, he has what we call veto power. The Imam, let's take a prophet. When a prophet talks, veto power. You and I can talk all we want. When the prophet says something, it's done. Period. Here now what has happened is by, them going, by him going into hiding, he has opened, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened a new chapter of ijtihad, where now you and I struggle to understand the, the message and we are no longer eclipsed by the imam because the imam is behind the curtain and you find now great scholarship starting to come forward in the Ja'far school where one scholar coming up uh, uh, over the other, that they are all doing ijtihad of kitabullah, and the Sunnah of Rasul is Ahlul Bayt. So now it gives us this freedom to express ourselves. That's another dimension of why the Imam is in hiding. And then the final trial is the, high, is the trial of the unseen. Allah says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْبَ فِي هُدًا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ They believe in the unseen. The belief of the unseen of the Imam of the time and that intadhar, even if you don't see him, the desire to want to meet will make you submit to Allah because a love relationship of waiting for your beloved puts you in a unique mentality versus having the beloved present in front of you. You know, many people used to abuse the Prophet. People used to call him magician. People called him names. People threw rocks at him. Imagine, rahmatul alamin. How could people do that? Because when he's present, we have this habit of abusing. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, when we completed this religion, it is upon you to ponder that I will bring this Imam back. Now here's the final story. When Imam Sahib Zaman reappears, his, uh, the Holy Prophet has said he will appear at the Kaaba. He will call the people and the world will understand it. In fact, the messenger said, that when he talks, the whole world will listen to him at one time. Now go back 14 centuries ago, that wouldn't make sense. They must have thought he must have had this grand power of standing above earth and talking to people. Today, the internet, the, the, the media, the satellites, it's like this. It's no, no difference. Even Imam Ali alayhi salam says, there will come a time, there will be this instrument called antenna, where the world will communicate through that. Imam Ali alayhi salam mentions that. Even after the battle of Basra, he looks at it and says, soon this city will be underwater and you will see the domes look like the humps of camels and it's exactly what happened. Basra did flood. Exactly the prediction. Imam Ali alayhi salam even mentioned Hulagu Khan. There will be this group of people who will look like they have their faces fla flatter on their faces. They will be very light skinned. They will attack this nation with, you know, with a fierce force. And it is true. They say Hulagu Khan, when he attacked, the followers of Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, who were in Basra made alliances with Hulagu Khan before he attacked. And then when he attacked, you know, he destroyed all the cities except these cities. Then Hulagu comes and asks them, I didn't destroy your city because you came in alliance with me. But how did you know I was going to win? How did you know I was going to win this battle? They said, our 
Master Ali ibn Abi Talib has already told us about you, that you will be coming, therefore we knew which side to align on, and that's how their lives were saved. The point I'm saying is our Imams have that capacity through the Messenger to direct the humanity at this level, and finally the institution of justice. When the Imam reappears in, in Mecca, the world, people say when the Imam comes, a lot of bloodshed will take place. You know, some people say to me, oh, Imam will be walking up to his ankles in blood. He will be taking the sword and just killing and cutting. And I said, no, please. That's not how it's going to happen. Of course, don't you know? He's going to rule the world with blood. I said, no, he's not going to do that. I said, what do you mean? I mean, you know, this world is very bad. It's wicked. It's horrible. You need to kill people. I said, well, you've been watching too many Hollywood movies, you know. <laughs> it's not how it's going to happen. All the bombs and special effects and, you know, kaboom this way and kaboom that way. I said, no, there's no such stuff. I said, what do you mean? I said, you want to see the son of Imam, how it's going to be? It's going to be like Rasulullah. He is. The messenger said, the one who will come and save, he will have my name. He's my grandson. The prophet said. How is he going to do it? When the messenger went to Mecca, notice what he did. When the Meccans, under Abu Sufyan, leadership of Abu Sufyan, the Prophet was not going to take over Mecca. Allah Surah Al-Fat say, Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina. You find the messenger goes towards Mecca. His army is enacted. Why? Because the Meccans violated the 10-year treaty. Allah says, now go. You will enter and take this, this city. It's yours. I have promised you, take it. Look how the messenger did it. He could have gone with his army, fought with bloodshed and all of that. No, because Islam is a religion of peace. It's not a religion of blowing people up with terrorism and to plant ourselves with bombs that, yes, I need to take you to hell and I need to go to paradise. <laughs> this is absolute nonsense. Can you imagine Allah commissioning us to blow ourselves up so that we can go to paradise and they can go to hell? What nonsense is this? I'll explain it to you briefly. Forgive me if I don't remember, but I will explain it right now, shortly after this presentation. The Messenger of Allah, he arrives in Mecca at night, evening time. His army arrives in Mecca in the evening time. Listen to the strategy of the Holy Prophet and understand how our Imam is going to establish the same justice on this earth soon when he reappears. The Meccans knew that the soldiers are coming. They didn't know how big the army of the Prophet was. When they arrived in the evening, you know in Mecca you don't have street lamps. So it was typical behavior for soldiers when they travel that they would light a fire and ten soldiers would go around each fire. It was common. At night it gets cold, everybody lights a fire, ten soldiers around a fire. The Holy Prophet was a master strategist. He said to his soldiers, each one of you light one fire. Now Abu Sufyan is down there, he's counting the fires and he's multiplying it by ten. <laughs> In his mind he started to tremble, oh boy, that's a big army. So the Prophet sends a messenger right away, he comes, he sends a message, I'm ready to talk. The Prophet said, ready to talk too. He comes, he subdues him, Abu Sufyan surrenders. Takes protection with the Prophet. The next morning, the Prophet just walks into Mecca with minimal bloodshed. <laughs> this is the sign of prophethood. They are peace lovers, peacemakers, strategists. They save lives. They bring harmony. They don't like bloodshed. They don't like killing. They hate wars. They only indulge in it when the enemy starts killing. Then they have to go and get rid of the cancer. Otherwise, it's not in Islam. Salaam ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Our blessed Imam, inshallah, will do the same. The world will come with minimal bloodshed. I would hate to see a world ruled by a just leader at the cost of all that bloodshed. It leaves a bad taste in your tongue that you said, yes, we brought justice, but at the cost of annihilation of half the population or a third of the population. No, Imam will not do that. There will be justice, harmony, and our messengers say that the, it will flip. There will be injustice, but it will be a minority. Majority will be justice. Right now, majority is injustice. Minority is justice. It will flip opposite and the world will be a peaceful place and there will be no proselytizing where everybody has to become a Muslim. They say the blessed Imam will rule people by their own law. Like Rafid Deen, there's no compulsion in religion. When the Imam comes, he says, everybody become Muslim, they will behead you. No, 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 this is not Islam. 
Not at all. It's not allowed. You can never compel anyone to follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is forbidden. So Imam Sahib al-Zaman will rule people by their own law. Anytime they do something, what faith are you? He says, I'm a Christian. Okay. Biblical law. It will be so hard for them to live by that law, they will leave it and become believers. This is the understanding that we have. If you really follow the law of these other religions, it will become very difficult to bring harmony. And the Imam will rule them by their law. That is how most people will become submissive to Islam. Just through example, through leadership, through understanding. Not by compulsion. There is no compulsion in Islam. And I'll prove it to you. Look, in Surah to Taha, Musa as you know was raised by Pharaoh. Pharaoh was killing everybody. He was killing all the firstborns. What does he do? Allah says to Musa, he meets, he calls him on the mountain, you know, he says, Inni anastu naran sa'atikum minha bi khabarin aw atikum bi shahabin qabasin la'allakum tastalun. Musa alayhi salam sees a fire. He knows something is calling him. He is now married. He's got children. He's moving in this valley of Madian. He's leaving. He's by a tour of Sinai, mountain of Sinai. He sees a calling. Allah calls him. He goes up to the mountain. And Allah, he feels the presence of God and Allah is talking to him. Allah says, take your slippers off. Notice, you are in a sacred valley. So Musa removes his slippers. That's why we take our shoes off when we pray. People ask, why don't we just pray with shoes? Because it is the command of Allah that even Musa could not approach the valley, the sacred valley of Tua, with shoes. He removes his slippers. Allah says, approach. And Allah is talking to him now. And I'm going to go very fast. Allah says, idhab. Anta wa akhuka bi ayati wa la taniyafi dhikri. Listen to the words. Go you and your brother with my communications and don't be remiss in remembering me. Idhab ila Fir'aun innahu tagha. Go to Fir'aun. He has exceeded his boundaries. He has become inordinate. He is arrogant. He is killing. He is being very unjust. Who is Fir'aun, brothers and sisters? In the Qur'an, one of the worst examples of the human race that Allah addresses often, over and over, is Fir'aun. This is a lesson for us all as Muslims. Please, this is Islam. Any other brand of Islam is a concoction. Islam comes from the Qur'an, comes from the sunnah of Rasulullah, period. This is Islam. Look at what Islam says. Fir'aun is a killer, a murderer. One who kills the servants of Allah. You couldn't find a worse human being in the history of the human race than Pharaoh and his kind. Listen to what happens to him. Allah says, go to him. He has exceeded his boundaries. Allah doesn't say, go and curse him and damn him and kill him and hit him with the stick and take the snake and wrap it around his neck and whatever. You know? He says, فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنَا Look at what Allah says to Musa. He says, go. And when you speak to him, speak to him a gentle word. Be kind to him. Not even harsh. Pharaoh, you there. No. Allah says, قَوْلٌ مَعْرُوفٌ وَمَغْفِرَةٌ خَيْرٌ مِّن صَدَقَةٍ يَتْبَوْ Kind speech and forgiveness is better than charity followed by injury. But yeah, I helped you. Didn't I help you? You were poor. Remember? You were starving. I fed you. Remember that? Yeah. That's charity followed by injury. Allah says, kind speech and forgiveness is better than charity followed by injury. Here, Musa alayhi salam is going to Fir'aun. Allah says, وَقُولَ لَقَوْلًا لَيِّنَا Think about this. Kind speech. And what? For what? لَعَلَّهُ يَتَذَكَّرُ أَوْ يَخْشَ So maybe he will remember and be fearful. Subhanallah. Allah says, He says, they say to him, Oh Allah, we fear. He may hasten to do evil. Allah says, don't worry. I am with you. What's the moral lesson here? Who has the right to go and bomb somebody? Who has the right in Islam to say, this guy belongs to this madhab, they do this and this and this, go kill them. This is, it's wajib to kill these people. When you kill them, you go to paradise. You know what happened in, in Iraq recently? A brother told me himself, he says, a man strapped himself with a bomb and he came inside the haram of Imam Hussein. 
Now why would you come in the haram of Imam Hussein to blow yourself up? Hussein ibn Ali is the holy prophet's grave. This is Hussein no minni wa ana min Hussein. What harm has he done to you? When did he tell us to go kill people? When did he tell us to be terrorists? These enemies are the ones who call us terrorism. Islam, by the way, is the only religion in the world named peace and submission. All other religions are named after people and objects. Can you imagine, at least if you're going to make a religion, name it properly. No one can even name a religion properly. Islam is the only religion which means peace and submission. Today we are accused of being terrorists. Can you imagine the irony? My religion means peace, but yet it means terrorism. What nonsense is this? But because they want to point a finger at us. When Joe Schmo does something, oh, Islam, fundamentalist, extremist, Muslim, Islamic. I said David Koresh armed himself to his teeth in America, in, in, in Texas. He was going to kill everybody in America. He was reading the Bible backwards and forwards. No one ever called him a Christian terrorist. And rightfully so. He should not be called a Christian terrorist. You should call him a cult leader. A terrorist of his own kind. Call these crazies who blow themselves up in front of people. Don't call them Muslims. These are crazies. These are cult leaders. These are foolish people. These are not representatives of Islam. This is haram in Islam. Forbidden that even Musa was not allowed. A prophet of God with his brother who was a prophet was not allowed to be harsh with Pharaoh who was the arch enemy of God. You and I can be arch enemies of each other. What logic is this? We blow each other. It happened in Iraq that a man comes and he straps himself with a bomb. Look at the jahiliyyah. The Prophet said, if the worst case of a human being is jahiliyyah. Ignorance. An ignorant man will love you and kill you. The Prophet said, I'd rather have a wise enemy than an ignorant friend. For my wise enemy will think twice before he kills me. An ignorant man while hugging me will choke me. Honestly, ignorance, deadly. And you know, there are dime a dozen today, ignorant people. Dime a dozen. You want, for 10 cents, you get a dozen of them. So what happens? You just breed them. Breed them. They'll come to you. They'll bomb, they'll blow themselves up. Because if you keep injecting in them, paradise, Jannah, Jannah, Jannah. Like this idea of 72 virgins. I get asked this question all the time in America. What is this with your 72 virgins? I say, you know, as a Muslim, I never heard of it. <laughs> It's your introduction. I never heard of this. He says, no, it's in the hadith somewhere. I said, look, I'm a Muslim. I read the Quran. Thank you. Quote the Quran, please. There's no 72 virgins. I don't know where you got this from. You make this up. You've been watching too many Hollywood, Bollywood movies here. That's your problem with this virgin business, you know? I said, for us, we don't, we're not promised 72 virgins. Allah says, يَتُوفُ عَلَيْهُمْ وَلْدَانٌ مُخَلَّدُونَ It's a peaceful, loving, great religion that Allah has promised paradise. There's no business of virginity in that. Virginity in humanity, in purity, yes, we have it. What's 72? I need to blow you up to get 72? What kind of silly idea is this? Where'd you get this from? And then they back off. I said, give me evidence, please, because you're insulting my intelligence here. Don't belittle my religion. It didn't come, you know, it didn't fall off a truck yesterday. It's got meaning here, excuse me. So, anyway, the point I'm saying is this guy strapped himself with a bomb, and he walked in and they suspected him. Alhamdulillah. They captured him. They captured him recently. This is very recent. They captured him and they removed the bomb. But they say the Iraqi community was so emotional about this. Because this is really just devastating. You know, it destroys people. They started beating this man up to a pulp. And the police came in, pulled him out. And the man was crying. So they said to him, look, we're sorry they beat you up. They said, no, I'm not sorry for that. They said, why are you sorry? He says, they denied me paradise. <laughs> SubhanAllah. What do you do with a person? I'd rather have a donkey. At least he knows what to do. What do you do with such a person? Allah says, وَإِذَا خَاتَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامًا When you see jahil, please don't talk to him. It's like throwing pebbles in a muddy pathway. It's going to splatter. Watch out. You need to tiptoe. Get out. It's going to get you dirty. Be careful. Jahiliyyah. There is so much of it. My conclusion in this message, brothers, all of us, please, let us get out of jahiliyyah. Let us study, let us read. The Prophet said, Acquire knowledge from the cradle to the grave. Keep learning, studying. It's good for you. The more you know, the more broad-minded you will be, the less dangerous you will be. People who are tunnel vision are the most dangerous people in society. The most dangerous, the ones who live in cocoons with tunnel visions. Very, very dangerous. Let's get out of that. This damage that's taking place today is causing harm in our ummah. 
that even our, within our communities we are not safe with each other. And then our enemies are having a field day with us, dividing us and conquering us. We must not allow that. Our ummah should be united. Even between our school's differences, please understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has united us with the principles of Islam and the messenger is the center authority of unity. Please, please, I say to you, please, with sincerity, the enemies want us to be divided. They want us to bicker on petty issues so they can rule us. And the Messenger of Allah showed us that in Medina, he took control of Medina, he defeated the Bani Israel, he even brought down the Banu Quraidah, Banu Qaynuqa, Banu Nadir. He brought them down. How did he do that? They were the empires of that time. They were the wealthiest people. They owned the biggest palaces. They owned the country. The, bro the Prophet brought them down and subdued them through unity. He brought the two Arab tribes of Aws and Khazraj together who became the Ansar and he loved them so much. The lesson in Islam is unite with the Prophet and let's see if the world will be able to touch us as Muslims. And we should respect people of other religions and not be condescending. So I conclude, there's much for me to say. Uh, anyway, inshallah we will talk about it. Uh, but this issue of terrorism should be vociferously challenged. And even 9-11, I always say it in America. When 9-11 took place, I said, whoever did 9-11, may God destroy them forever. Subhanallah. Whoever did 9-11, may Allah destroy them. Let Allah decide who did it. <laughs> Allah is just, you know. And know who's going to say no. <laughs> it's interesting. You find anybody who commits terrorism in the world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should destroy them. Because this world should be the world of peace and tranquility. Brothers and sisters, finally, in Karbala, we remember this great event where Imam Hussein took the women. Tonight, the women, sisters, I address this to the brothers and the sisters. Our women are the source of our humanity. Our children are born through our women. People ask, why are women wearing hijab? Why don't men wear hijab? I said, because God put the womb in the woman. She is the carrier of our children. And Islam prescribes that prevention is better than cure, and therefore hijab is a preventer of adulteration. And therefore the hijab is on the woman. And her jihad is that. And I believe the hijab is the flag of Islam. And the flag of Islam through the hijab is the flag of modesty. Today our biggest battle in religions is the battle of modesty. It's the battle of dignity. Our children today in societies are born, many of them illegitimately. Today there is crime, the crime rates are going up because of indecency. Indecency is the cause of the destruction of society. Decency is the protector of society. And hijab is the flag of womanhood that is public. Remember, hijab is a public dress. For those of us, I understand some fathers and brothers and husbands don't want their wives to wear hijab. How can you say that, brothers and sisters, unless you don't know the sharia of the Quran? Allah says, Ya yuhan nabi, qul li azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'minina yudnina alayhinna min jalabibihinna. Allah is saying, O Messenger, tell Kulli Azwajika, your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to don themselves with Jalabiyya. What is the Jalabiyya? What is the purpose? Allah says, This is better, so they are recognized. Thalik Adna and Yu'rafna. Yu'rafna means to be recognized. A woman should be recognized, dignified, should be recognized in representing womanhood as motherhood. In fact, I ask many great scholars, why has Allah not made women prophets or representatives of Allah for their society? And the answer the messenger gave is Allah has given motherhood to women. And motherhood is like prophethood. That she bears the child. Your mothers carry you pain upon pain. For two years they wean you. How merciful God is. And how merciful is your mother to carry you. That's why you notice fathers will walk away from the children. But mothers will never walk away from the children. Majority of them. Because that 
that pain bonds them permanently. And Allah says, protect that womb so that the children who come out are beautiful children so they become a blessing for society, not an anathema. Hence the hijab, sisters, is for that. It's not an impractical dress. In America, in the rest of the world, you can carve your face with tattoos, stick all kinds of pins, make your tongue hang out and stick out anyway, wear it upside down, don't wear it, wear whatever, no one's got a problem. Color your hair to glow in the dark, no problem. <laughs> but you cover your head? Oh my God, blasphemy! Why blasphemy? Oh, because you remind me of too much modesty. And I'm not in the business of modesty. I like to indulge in my passion. You see that? That's why we are being attacked. Please don't fall for that trick. You are the flag bearers of Islam. Be proud and us men too. We need to protect our women's interests. We need to create institutions for them to have their ability to enjoy their lives while they wear the hijab. If we don't do it, we can't blame them for feeling debilitated in societies. We need to to do it, it's upon us. But I conclude that in Karbala, Imam Hussein took the women because they were the media, they were the flag bearers, and until today, that flag of Zainab alayhi salam in Karbala stands. That when we cry, even one tear, when we say Zainab, how much we remember you all, oh, Zainab. What a great woman Zainab was. They say when Zainab alayhi salam comes home to her husband Abdullah bin Jafar Tayyar after one year of imprisonment, historians say she was so burnt out that when she knocked on the door of her husband he says yes oh believer what can I do for you she says don't you recognize me that I'm your wife Anna Zainab don't you recognize who I am even her husband didn't recognize how worn she was this is how these women paid a price historian says Zainab was pulled either to Syria or to Egypt and somebody hit her with a bucket of water and she became shaheed and she died that's why she was buried there Zainab alayhi salam was the walking talking Amir al-Mu'mineen they say as a young woman when she spoke from behind curtains people thought Imam Ali salam was talking except it was a woman talking this is how Zainab salam was she comes in front of Yazid look she doesn't even address him as Amir al muminin she says to him oh you ya ibn tulaqi oh you son of a freed slave because his father was a slave of the holy prophet the prophet freed him he said you are the son of a freed slave what is your degree between us and you can you compare yourself with us and you have chained us he says I have killed you Zainab says yes you have loped our branches but I see nothing but rahmah from God I see nothing but grace of God this is the answer of a woman like Zainab brothers and sisters Imam Hussein had a wife named as Rabab Rabab was present in Karbala Rabab's little son Abdullah known as Ali Asghar was killed by Hurmala they took his blessed little head too. You know the little head which Imam Hussein buried. They pulled it out of the grave and they cut the head off from the body and they put it on a spear to present it to their king. This is the illegitimacy of the people. Rabab witnessed that. She saw her blessed little son's head on a spear. They say that as soon as she was released from Syria, she goes back to Karbala. Subhanallah, look at the media power that this woman was so strong. She pitched a tent in Karbala. She remained in Karbala till she died. You know that? They say she remained there. She didn't want to leave her husband. She didn't want to leave the shuhada. And every time she would see a caravan coming, she would come out of the caravan in a hijab. She would welcome them. Come. And the caravan would come. And she said, sit down. Let me tell you what just happened here. This is how Rabab was. This is the womanhood of Rabab. You go to Ummul Banin, the father, the mother of Abbas alayhi salam. She is in Medina, Jannatul Baqi. She would take Abbas's little sons who are now orphans. She would go to Jannatul Baqi and she would invite the people, come, let me tell you what happened in Karbala. How Hussein ibn Ali was killed. How my four sons were massacred in Karbala. This remembrance, brothers and sisters, is not only to shed tears. It is to put it in action. It is to pray that these women who represented us, these these men who represented us in Karbala is not a matter of just traditions and cultures, it is to practice it. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs> 
اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين Every one of you, may Allah reward you for all the good work that you do All the brothers, all of you, you are just a wonderful community here I really pray for your success. I see the diversity of faces. It just makes my heart so happy. I see faces of different cultures, people coming together. We're united for Allah, for Islam, for justice, for unity. This is the most beautiful flag of Islam, honestly. My brother, you've said beautiful Quran. Allah, protect your voice, inshallah. It's, I, I admire people who read Quran. I admire people who read the kalam of Allah. Quran, Allah says, وَلَقَدْ يَسَّرْنَ الْقُرْآنَ لِلْذِكْرِ فَهَلْ مِنْ مُدَّكِرِ We made the Quran easy to remember. Which of you will take heed? Allah repeats this four times in Surah Al-Qamar. Please, brothers and sisters, all of us, we should be walking, talking Quran. Quran, Quran. وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ مَا هُوَ شِفَاءٌ وَرَحْمَةٌ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا خَسَارَةٌ what we revealed in the Quran, Allah says, وَنُنَزِّلُ مِنَ الْقُرْآنِ It is shafa'a, it is your intercessor, it is your mercy, وَرَحْمَةً وَلَا يَزِيدُ الظَّالِمِينَ And it doesn't increase anything for the, for the wrongdoers, the evildoers, except destruction. Quran, it's an elixir. Read it, it calms us. Miracles happen. Read one verse, it's amazing. It's powerful. Please, encourage each other. We, bring, we want more Qaris to come. I remember my other brother Habib who's been reciting also, may Allah bless his soul, uh, his spirit, every one of you, your tongues. When we speak, we bring unity, we bring harmony. Please, let's recite it, let's practice it, teach our children to read it. It's extremely important. Inshallah, you will do that. And I want to thank you all, really. It's been a wonderful experience for me in these important nights. And forgive me if I've said anything to hurt anybody's feelings. It was no intention to hurt I feel greatly, greatly blessed and honored to have this opportunity to speak uh, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His religion. And may Allah give us the tawfiq, inshallah, to, give, to do justice in this religion and that we die believers and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises us with the Messenger and His Ahlul Bayt because those are the most important qualities that we need to follow by which to live in this world with success. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.